Hi and welcome to Tabletop Mini Showcase. I'm Jim and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at and painting Games Workshop's Tyranid Hormagort. Let's get to it. Games Workshop have recently released their Warhammer 40,000 10th edition box set Leviathan, which of course means a box full of their 40k poster boy, de facto unit shifters, the Space Marines. And obviously, as one army alone would make for a pretty boring battle game, it also includes a suitably formidable force to serve as their adversaries. And on this occasion, those adversaries are everybody's favourite space bugs, the Tyranids. Because of this, there has been a whole slew of Tyranid related content sweeping the community. High fleet enthusiasts are dancing in the street, high-fiving fellow swarm lovers and basking in the bioluminescent glow of the current Tyranid spotlight. And frankly, this sudden wave of galactic insectoid goodwill has really got me in the mood to paint some Tyranids. So I dusted off the box of Hormagorts that's been patiently sitting on my shelf for f knows how long now watching on as I slowly chip away at the seemingly never-ending mountain of grey plastic that is my Space Marines collection and I got to work. I cracked out my sprue clippers, plastic glue and hobby knife and set about assembling these gruesome space books and I was happy to discover they do actually go together quite quickly. Hmm, I'm happy to discover these go together quickly. The number of parts is reasonable and they don't require too much thinking in regards to assembly. Many of the mold lines are hidden by the sculpt and the few that aren't are fairly easily removable. The assembly of the heads does have a joint right down the centre of the face, but since these guys have an insect-like exoskeletal type of appearance, it really isn't that big a deal in regards to the overall aesthetics. Due to the posture and the fact these minis are based on 28mm bases, they do have a bit of a tendency to topple over if you don't have any magnets or extra weight on the bases in order to keep them balanced. But since I personally tend to build up my 40k bases with bark chips to give them a more rocky natural looking appearance that allows the minis to stand a little taller, this really wasn't much of an issue for me as the bark chips provide enough extra weight to keep them nice and stable. Having them based like this also gives the model a bit of an individual appearance as this way the repetitive structure of the Tyranids is slightly disguised by the lack of uniformity in the height of the bark chips. To do this I simply broke up a few bark chips from a bag of terrarium substrate and glued them down to the bases. The reason why I use terrarium bark chips rather than gardening bark chips is they tend to be a bit smaller than gardening bark chips and so require a bit less work to get them to fit on smaller spaces such as 28mm bases. Also they can be bought in smaller bags which means less heavy lifting when buying them and less space occupied in terms of storing them. Which in a country such as England where the average house size is quite small is definitely a bonus. The bark chips can be easily broken up by hand and they create a fantastically realistic rock-like surface for your minis to be mounted on. When it comes to attaching the hormigons to the bark chip covered bases, it would be quite difficult to cut off the slotter tab and put in a pin as they only use a singular point of contact, which is very narrow. So rather than attempt to do that, I instead chose to trim the tab down to a much smaller size with my clippers and use my hobby knife to cut a slot in the bark chip so that I can super glue the tab in and get a really solid connection that honestly has less chance of failing than what a pin would do anyway. The small area of slot tab that is visible is easily disguised with a little PVA glue and sand, which is also how I fill any big gaps between the bark chips and the areas between the base and the bark chips. When using PVA glue and sand as a filler like this, it really is best to mix the sand into the PVA glue and then apply it rather than dabbing on a bunch of glue and then throwing sand onto it because as that glue dries it will start to recede as the water evaporates and you will end up with a very different surface to how it started whereas when you have the sand mixed into the glue it's a lot more solid and you're going to have a lot less chance of it shrinking into the base as you put it on so any work you do will look pretty much the same once it's dry. Hi, right. that my friends is the assembly part of the process out of the way. Now it's time to see to those paint jobs. <laughs> I don't know if that's the correct way to 
pronounce the name, but I'm still gonna make that joke every time that I paint these. Every time. I began by giving the entire mini an undercoat with black paint through my airbrush. I did this as the mini is predominantly black and so it makes sense to use black as the base coat. I then went on to paint all the bone areas with Zandri dust and undercoat with white all of the areas that are going to be painted more brightly. It may take two or three coats of paint to get full opacity but it's better to have a good solid foundation to work from so that all the colours that follow will have maximum saturation. I held off on painting the teeth and the circles on the head here as I knew I would be doing a lot of back and forth when doing the graduation to a light shade on the face later down the line. I base coated the carapace with Jean Steeler Purple and for the fleshy areas around the joints and the circles I applied a magenta ink so that the recesses would have a strong saturated level of colour but the raised areas would be more lightly stained. I also painted in the eyes with a warm yellow. To create the graduation on the bone areas I applied thin glazes of Agrax Shade which I progressively shortened away from the ends of the bone. I again used Zandri Dust to paint in the edge highlights and added some striation lines down the surface to give the bone a more realistic appearance. The carapace was shaded with glazes of purple ink which I concentrated into the areas that would receive the most shadow. I glazed a lighter shade from the initial Gene Steeler purple onto all of the areas that would receive the most light. I also edge highlighted the carapace with this lighter tone before again adding in striation lines with both the lighter and darker purple tones in order to continue the natural look. As the Tyranids are covered with organic armour, any slight imperfections in the graduations just adds to the overall natural look of the Mini which makes these models a fantastic low risk training ground for practicing and developing your glazing and blending skills. For the black areas of the Tyranid, I started by glazing a navy blue onto the upward facing surfaces, progressively reducing the area that I covered with the glaze in order to create a smooth transition. I also did the same thing with the face and tail of the Mini, as the High Fleet C2 appear to have an overall lighter tone in these areas. To help ensure the transition was smooth, there was an amount of back and forth that I did in which I switched between glazing the navy blue onto the black and glazing black onto the navy blue. This helped to smooth out the transitions, creating a suitably convincing gradient. I followed that up by glazing a very small amount of light blue into the centre of the navy blue areas to serve as the final highlight. I also used this light blue to edge highlight the black areas of the Tyranid. I deliberately upped the intensity of these steps when painting the face and tail in order to amplify the difference in coloration of these areas in contrast with the rest of the body. Again when doing this there was an element of back and forth that was implemented so as to maximise the smoothness of the transitions. I also applied a glaze of navy blue over the edge highlights in the areas where the body transitions shifted to their darkest tone since if these areas of the edge highlights don't obey the same lighting dynamics as the rest of the mini it can lead to them looking out of place and create a jarring look that is actually behaving in opposition to the work we have just put in when creating lighting circumstances on the flat areas of the body. I carefully picked out the teeth with Sandry dust and added a white undercoat to the circles on the head before applying the magenta ink to this area to finish up the mini. The base was base coated with scrag brown that was pretty well diluted so that it created a very uneven coverage as I want this area to appear like a dirty rocky type of area. I then added a few grass tufts around the base as though they were growing from in between the rocks and added some orange pigment powder to the base to create the look of a dusty Martian like surface. When applying the pigment powder I make sure to get the powder into the grass as well as on the base as in nature dust will be blown around a surface in all areas. I turn the mini onto its side and tap the edge of the base so as to knock off the excess pigment as this is far less likely to send pigment powder all over the paintwork I've just done than if I was to try to simply blow the excess powder off. Finally I took my 5M felt tip black Posca paint pen and drew around the base rim to tidy up the edge. And there we have it, one finished High Fleet C2 Hormigon. Personally I really love this colour scheme. The black body has a real Ridley Scott's alien type of vibe and the bursts of colour remind me of both the vast insect and aquatic colorations that we see in nature 
as well as the Gene Stealer colorway that many speculate is the original color of the Prime Tyranid Hive. Transitioning black into blue highlights isn't something I have a lot of experience with, but it is a color pattern I find particularly pleasing. So getting the opportunity to put some time into developing this area of knowledge has been really fun and hopefully it will lead to me tackling other minis of a similar palette at some point in the future. If the current 10th edition content you've seen has got you jones into painting up some Tyranids, but you don't have the finances to invest in the game, grabbing a box of Hormagaunts or Termagaunts from the Games Workshop web store or your local hobby store is a great way to scratch that itch. If money's really tight, heck, you could just buy a single mini from eBay, or maybe even trade a mini you don't like with a Tyranid collecting friend and give the old space bugs a try that way. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to continue seeing more content like this then please consider hitting the like, share and subscribe buttons. As making videos like this takes a lot of time and effort and at my current subscribe account I can't even monetize for ad revenue. Which means every time you guys watch one of the adverts on my videos I receive 0% of the profits from that ad. Regardless of the literal days that I have put into planning, scripting, filming and editing my videos. It costs you absolutely nothing to subscribe but it provides me with a way to make money doing something that I love which is making content to entertain you guys and after years of working in manual labour doing jobs that have caused irreversible damage to my body getting paid to do something that I love and that doesn't cause me agony is something that I would wholeheartedly welcome and very much appreciate. Also, if you don't want to miss out on any of my upcoming videos, hit the little notification bell. That way you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video. If you guys are looking for something else to watch and you can't be asked to type anything into the search bar, maybe consider checking out one of these videos. Legend has it, the dudes that watch them have significantly bigger dicks than the dudes that don't. It's science. Hi. Until next time, action!